Uh, my name is Don Caps. I work for Network Appliance. Uh, I'm the primary author of uh, IOZone and Maintainer, as well as the author and one of the the primary author and one of the maintainers of the Spec SFS 2014 benchmark. Um, we're going to be talking about how to use the that benchmark inside of the Emerald framework. So things that are not in this presentation are things like setting up AC power, how to hook up your power meter, how to install window and set up Windows and Unix systems, how to properly set up and configure DNS, and how to set up the switches in your lab, and how to install Active Directory domains. Uh, so there's there's quite a bit of you know assumption that you you know you have experts available on these topics to help set up a lab correctly so that it can run high stress workloads and not uh, you know fall over dead or get goofy. Um, this is a high stress workload, so we, when you're doing things like running a high stress workload that does a lot of network traffic. Uh, if you've got your, in, any of your infrastructure in your lab is set up on a virtualized machine, such as putting your DNS server on a virtualized you know, machine, if that machine is also generating load and it becomes busy, uh, it's possible that your DNS server will not respond appropriately or quickly enough and that the test could die uh, because it timed out waiting for a DNS server. So in general, you, you need to understand if you're this is a high stress workload, so your infrastructure needs to be robust and properly configured. Uh, we've already watched the two videos, so yay. All right, it's kind of our quick overview table of contents here. So we're going to talk a little bit about block diagram, which I think Patrick already gave you a nice little show there. And we're going to talk a little bit about what is S-Flow and how to set it up on your switches and how to collect its output. And uh, how to how to do a basic install, you know, of, of your client operating systems, how to configure your nodes. Uh, then we're going to have some actual testing that we test to make sure DNS is properly configured before we start the test, because discovering this four or five hours later is very painful. Uh, how to properly set up your storage, uh, balancing your load across all of the network interfaces and storage spindles if you have them so that your workload is evenly distributed across the available resources. Uh, and then we're going to talk about configuring the actual benchmark. So there's a configuration file. It has about eight things you need to edit. Um, these are the names of the little variables. We'll go into that more later. And then we're going to actually show you how to run the SFS benchmark, how to monitor its progress and examining some of its results. And then start working on, okay, how do we find the peak, the optimal peak performance for each of the workloads? Uh, and then once you've got all those things, and we're going to have to merge together the data from that was gathered by this S-Flow thing and the power meter and create you, you, another little tool called TAG2014, which helps pull out some of those uh, numbers for you, helps automate the process, and then how to fill out the TDR. Uh, and then we'll go through uh, what happens if things go wrong. So these are some of the, if things go wrong with, you know, where do you go look for help? All right. So again, we're going to go back to the kind of the block diagram here. So in the file world, we actually have IO load generators that are going to be running the SFS 2014 benchmark and presenting load upon the storage system. So that's the product under test. Um, you're, you're going to be collecting your I.O. throughput with a technology called S-Flow, uh, which we're going to actually collect the information from the switches themselves. So S-Flow is this, it's a leading multi-vendor standard, okay, that almost every switch provider, manufacturer, uh, has embedded in their switch. So it allows you to configure the switch in such a way that it will sample all of the data that's flowing through the switch and send that information, kind of a, a summary okay, of that information, off to some IP address that you get to choose. And on that magical IP address that you chose, you'll be running some software that collects that information uh, and logs it to a file so that we can then later come back and merge all that information together. So. That's what S-Flow is. It is a 
it's available pretty much in every switch out there. Um, when you go to set up S-Flow on the switch, so I'm going to walk through an actual switch where I set it up here. Uh, this is a Quanta LB6M switch, which is a 10 gigabit backbone switch, 24-port uh, fiber optic switch. So the, on this thing, you, you log into it. And in most cases, you need to be the administrator because you're going to make configuration changes to the switch itself. Then you have to elevate your privilege. On this switch, you have to elevate your privilege level. And then you're going to go into a configuration screen so that you can actually go configure the switch. And then we're going to set up, OK, we want S-Flow to be active. And we want to tell it, I have a receiver. Now, on this switch, you can have more than one receiver. So I'm telling him on receiver number one, I'm going to tell you his IP address. And then for receiver one, later we'll go back and configure what it, what all is going to be sent out to receiver one. But that's what this is doing is saying, I have a receiver. His, his you know, name is receiver one, and he's going to send out his samples off to this guy. And then we're going to go actually choose what interfaces do we want to collect S-Flow data on. All right, so in this case, I chose uh, choose all the ports. Okay, and I just said, well, I'll just monitor all the ports and keep track of all of them. I don't, I don't really need to, you know, be specific. I can just say track all the ports and send me all the data on all the ports. Now, in this particular lab where I'm running this, there aren't that many active ports on the switch. There's a port, you know, coming from um, all of the load generators. There's a port coming from coming and going to the uh, to the, the product under test. And I think there's an upload uplink port to some other switches. So there's not a lot active on this switch. So it's pretty easy to keep track of what's going on. And then we're going to say, OK, now I've told him what, what interfaces I want. Now I need to tell him what kind of interval do I want you to collect this information on. So again, this particular switch has the ability to have multiple you know, events if you want, and multiple timers running. So I said, OK, for create me a polar whose name is number one, and I'm going to set him up to collect data every five seconds. Uh, I believe our spec says 10 seconds, but I like to have more samples. I can always throw some away. And that's it. Your switch is now configured. And as data is flowing through that switch, it will create these samples and send them off to the collector. So what is this collector thing? Well, there, there's a couple of collectors that are out there you can download for free. Uh, Inmon.com is a major provider of S-Flow and tools. And they have two tools out there that you can download. Uh, actually, they have three. but. Anyway, the first one is called S-Flow Tool. It's from their developer kit. And it is a very simple tool that says, and it can, you can compile it and run it on Windows or on Linux or BSD or whatever. The source is available. And it collects the information that's being sent to it from the switch and simply dumps that output to a file or to the, to the screen. And that's it. And you can choose you know, with this tool, how do you want the information formatted? You could say, give me a textual output, or give me a comma, a comma and space delimited you know, one line per sample. Uh, you can tell them at the configuration time that's what you want. And then there's another tool out there called S-Flow Trend, which is a collector and analyzer. Uh, there's a free download version that has limited functionality, but it does do some, some nice things. Uh, then there's a pro version that is kind of sort of pricey. Uh, but if you're doing a lot of analysis of uh, data center switching, uh, the, it might be worth your time to take a look at the, the freeware version, the S-Flow Trend, uh, you know, the, the trialware version, and see if it's something that you might want to spend money on. It, it is a nice tool for looking at your network. So when you go out to the Inmon site and you say, I want to go down, go get this thing called S-Flow Tool, which is what we're going to be using today to grab the data and collect it. And you can download either the source code or you can go get it, you know, a pre-compiled version of Windows from the Enmon site. And at the top, you can see the URL, so you can go, go grab this thing.
um, when you actually go to run the sflow tool, we're going to give them a couple of parameters. The first one is minus four, which means I'm going to be collecting over TCP IP version four. And the next one is this minus capital L. And that's a new option that uh, Nick Principe uh, from I IX Systems has added and has a, pu a pull request. It, this, all the source is maintained on GitHub. Uh, he put it in this, uh, this additional minus capital L that says, when you're giving me these comma and space delimited lines, uh, give me a timestamp uh, in the line as well. The default before the, his patch uh, was that it didn't give you a timestamp if you're in the CSV format, but it did give you a timestamp if you were in the textual format. So this was just kind of blending the two together so that you can do everything from a CSV file format. So when you actually are running this tool and you've used the minus four and minus L, if you were to look at the, what the, what's accumulating in that file, <laughs> this is what it looks like. So you'll see a control record, and then you'll see the IP address of the switch itself that sent you this record, and then a timestamp, uh, and then you'll see a port, and what's called an index number. So that port 24 is the port I'm collecting information on, and 6 is his relative index in his collection mechanism. Not terribly important. The port's what's, what's really important that I'm that we're going to be using later to uh, merge our data sets. And then you'll see the invites. Now the invites is kind of interesting because it is not invites um, in the sample. It is the total number of bytes since you turned on SLOW. So each one of those is just an accumulating counter. So if you want to see how fast is the data actually flowing, you take the invites from line two and you know subtract line one and you'll get how many went through in that sample between line one or actually in line two. So you have to subtract one from the other in order to see the actual data rate, the throughput. So you have input and then you also have the out bytes which is further over. And so your total would be you add those together. So you subtract line two's in bytes from line one's in, in, in bytes line two's out bytes from line, or line one's out bytes, out bytes subtracted from line two out bytes, and you see you add those together and you get the total number of bytes flowing through your switch for each of those samples. Uh, I'm going to give you a little overview on the sflow trend tool. We're not going to be using it for actually creating SNEA or Emerald results, but it is a nice tool. I did want to kind of bring it up in case people want to go look at this. It'll give you a thing like this, where you have a dashboard, and the S-Flow collector is getting a lot of samples. Well, they may be coming from one or more switches. Uh, so it'll actually identify in these bars, you know, which, which switch and which port on that switch is giving you the activity. So you can see the top interfaces by uh, activity and total frames, blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of interesting. And then you can also look at uh, this S-Flow trend is capable of generating some reports. Uh, so when it's been running for a while, you say, oh, I'd like to see what's going on now. You can click generate me a report, and you'll get something like this, where here I've selected, I want uh, a list of who's the top you know, servers that are busying up my switch right now. And you, this will actually include both invites. I think it's both invites and out. Go back. Uh, I should have made that frame smaller. So the in bytes is the red and the out bytes is the orange. So it's keeping track of both of those and giving you a graph so you can see uh, what's going on. Uh, and it'll give you a graph, a separate graph for each of these servers so you can actually walk through and find out in your data center which servers are consuming the switch and how much are they doing per, you know, for each one, which is kind of handy if you're, if you're fighting a, a, some kind of a networking throughput issue. You can also go down and zoom in on a particular port on the switch, and you can see you know, how many bytes are coming in, how many bytes are going out, and you can choose the actual IP address of the switch that you're looking at and what interface, what port on that switch do you want to look at, and you can get its throughput, uh, its utilization, um, 
interesting stuff, megabytes per second, blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of handy if you're fighting a switch problem. Okay, so now that we've got our collector configured and he's going to be generating our little log file, we're going to have to get that guy started right before we actually say, okay, we're going to kick off, you know, a load generation and the actual runs. But before we can do that, we need to go install some clients so that we got something we can run the load generator on. Now, the SPEC SFS 2014 benchmark uh, is supported uh, running on Linux, BSD, um, Mac OS, Windows, and Solaris. Um, I think that's all of them. So it's got five different operating systems. So you can you can either download the kit, okay, and run the buy pre-built binaries, or you can actually build it yourself. The kit comes with all the source software. So if you want to rebuild the kit, you for Windows, you can use Visual Studio and rebuild it, or you can use Make you know, on a Linux machine or Unix machine. Um, so here we're going to go through a kind of a, I need some, I need some load generators. So here I picked a CentOS 7 installation disk and said, okay, let's boot, boot that up and we'll install it. So here's his install screen. We tell him, well, English is good. Then we're going to go in and make sure that we uh, have a server with a GUI because I don't really want a command line interface when we're talking with these things. And I'd like to turn on the network file system, NFS, because that's what I'm planning on running my workload on top of, is NFS. Um, if you were installing Windows, of course, you would be running on top of SIFS. But if you don't turn these packages on when you do the install, then you won't necessarily have that capability. So make sure you turn that on. Go up and configure an interface so you have an interface to talk over. Now, in this particular case, there's only one interface uh, showing right now on this load generator. Uh, I recommend that most people set up load generators with two interfaces, two network interfaces, where you have one network interface that you're going to use to talk to the load generator to configure it, to monitor it. And the other interface is used for actually generating the traffic to the storage server. And the reason I always recommend a separation between your control and your data plane is because once you get the data really moving, and this is a stressful benchmark, so it can really push your you know, throughput to a very, uh, very high you know, throughput value, uh, you, you really don't want to lose control of your ability to monitor or look at or even shut down uh, the load generators. So I, I typically recommend two interfaces. Uh, in this case, I, I have to. The other one's just not visible because it's happening through the magic of virtualization. And I can set up some disk. Give him, I don't know, 40 gig of space. He doesn't need that much space. Um, he could probably get by with a minimal install of maybe 10 or 20 gig. But I usually standardize on 40 and say, well, give me some room to put files over there in case I want something else on the load generator besides just the benchmark. And we set up our password and our user, you know, create some users. And then once I finally get it installed, I log in, and I, I'm going to set up SSH, okay, on this machine, such that there's no password challenge. So I do the SSH keygen, and then when it asks for password, I just keep pushing enter until it's done. Okay. <laughs> so I can SSH into this machine, uh, without having any password challenges. Now, we're going to actually do the same thing on all the load generators. So we're going to install, you know, generally, you're going to install more than one load generator, unless it's a very beefy load generator that has lots of memory and lots of network interface cards. Then you might not need very many load generators. In this case, I'm going to tell you that you probably have more than one physical load generator out there. So you're going to install, you know, install the operating system and make sure that the thing can at least SSH into itself. And sure enough, here he is SSHing into himself. He said, you want to keep it? Yeah, let me in. And yep, it's working. OK, now notice that I SSH in by his host name, All right? And it came back and said, the authenticity of this host is at 10.0.0.169, but it gave me his IP address, okay? 
So one of the typical mistakes that people make is they install an operating system and they don't go look at the you know, on Unix boxes. They forget to go look at slash Etsy slash host file. And on some operating systems, when they do that, when they do a scratch install, there's a line in there that's a loopback, okay, IP address, 127.0.0.1. And it's usually got a name like loopback or localhost to the right. And on some operating system installs, it also has this host, this client's host name is on the same line as the loopback address. Uh, it turns out that's not a good idea in general because if this host were to send, you know, were to look up, do a DNS lookup on his, on himself by his host name, he would see that entry in the Etsy host file and he might transmit that to a remote client saying, here, when you want to connect to me, here's my IP address. Well, you don't really want him sending 127.0.0.1 to a remote client and saying, here's how you contact me, because that's not going to work. So here you can see I, by that one line, it says, I have an IP address. It's not the loopback address. So that kind of helps you validate that you don't have a, a screwy um, Etsy host file. Now we got him basically set up, but he doesn't have any software on him. He's just kind of a basic uh, install with NFS turn on. So uh, this benchmark, one of his requirements is that he has Python 2.6-ish or 2.7-ish, something 2.6 or later, but not 3.x. So we don't want Python 3. Now on most Linux machines, when you install them, they come with Python already installed, so you don't need to do this step. But I can guarantee you on a Windows machine, it does not come pre-installed with Python, and you will need to do this step. So you can go out to www.python.org and download and install a 2.6 version, okay, not a 3.x version. So then we're going to actually install SpecSFS, okay, the actual benchmark. So when you bought the SpecSFS uh, kit, uh, you got a DVD or you got a download of an ISO file and you invert your own DVD or whatever. So the way I typically do this is the DVD itself contains all of the source and all of the binaries and it has a directory structure and files with names on the disk. Those names are, you know, a mixed uppercase and lowercase. So when you stick this disk in a Windows machine and you look at it, you'll see uppercase and lowercase, and it all works just great. However, I have seen on some Unix machines, when you stick a DVD that has files on it that have uppercase and lowercase, some versions of Unix will map everything to uppercase. Others will map everything to lowercase. And either of those is bad. It has to do with the amount uh, command line option and the defaults that these various different Unix machines use and if they are honoring what's called the Rockwell you know, format which includes uppercase and lowercase. So if you're going to be installing, my recommendation is if you're going to be installing this software on a Unix machine, rather than stick the DVD in the Unix machine and spend the next three or four hours playing how do I get Rock, you know, the Rock Ridge uh, extensions to work correctly, uh, why don't I just go over to my Windows machine, stick the DVD in, and copy everything off to some interesting NFS mount point, and then on some server somewhere, and then I can walk over to every client and just say, mount that file system that's been exported, and let's copy all of the distribution off, and now you won't have to worry about uppercase, lowercase, rock ridge extensions, or anything else because NFS will do the right thing. It will maintain the correct case-sensitive file transfer. So that's how I'm going to do it, as I'm going to mount myself a copy over NFS. And then I'm going to CD into where I mounted it, and I'm going to copy minus R as recursively everything from the distribution over to wherever I want to install it. And in this case, I said, well, my current working directory is fine. Just install it here. 
When you're done, you can do an ls, and you should see this new directory, spec sfs 2014 underscore sp2. And if you were to cd in that directory and look around, you would see here's all those pretty files. And notice the uppercase and lowercase. And, and it's important that they actually be uppercase and lowercase. If you see uh, that everything is now upper or everything is now lower, it's don't even bother trying to run it. It's not going to run. You need to get that straightened out before you you know, to attempt to go forward. Uh, the pre-compiled binaries are under the binaries directory. Uh, if you want to make it yourself, you can either type make, or you can, if you're on a Windows machine, you double click on MS build, and then you click on the solution file, and click the build button, and that will build your software as well. You, for the most part, you should be able to use the pre-compiled binaries. They, like I said, there's five different supported platforms out there, so it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, there's also binaries for both 32-bit and 64-bit on all the supported platforms. So again, you should be able to run this on without having to build the binaries yourself. Okay, once we've got that set up, then we probably need to configure the client. Okay, to actually say we're going to set up this test. Okay, uh, we're going to jump into a little bit of configuring our client uh, that we're we just finished installing an operating system. We put some SFS software on him. And now we need to configure our client. So one of the things that um, I should explain about how this software works is you ins you're going to install the software on all of the clients that are going to be generating load. And then the way the benchmark works internally is it uses on Linux machines or Unix machines, it uses SSH to start all of the instances running across those machines that you've got the software installed on. But it needs to have a password less, okay, no password challenge, okay, capability to be able to SSH over to a remote client and do some work like start the benchmark going, okay. So in order to do that, we need to get all of the clients set up so that you can actually have the, the prime client, which is the very first one you installed and where you're going to start the benchmark running from, he needs to have the ability to SSH into all of the other remote clients without a password challenge to start the benchmark going. So here, in the uh, I copied into the slide deck, this is for the Appendix B from the SFS 2014 User's Guide. And this is a handy little script that you can edit the hosts down there, there's a variable called hosts, and you put in a list of all of the client host names that you're going to install this uh, software on, or you've installed the software on, and you'd like to now set up the passwordless challenge so that in the future you it will be able to run and not have password challenges every time it starts trying to run something on a remote node. So this script actually generates all of the SSH keys and sets it up so that the prime, the client, can can get things running on all of the clients that you have participating as load generators. So I just copied it in here. So you can just cut and paste it out if you want. Or you can get it from the SFS 2014 User's Guide Appendix B. Now once you've got that working, so you've got the ability for the prime client, the first client, you're, and the one you're going to be running things from, once you got him configured so he can password, let's get into everybody, okay, then you need to consider tuning the actual client operating system. Most client operating systems arrive with a stock set of out-of-the-box tunes, which may or may not be appropriate for generating a hellaciously high level of load, uh, which is what we're going to be doing with this benchmark. So here are some typical tunes for a Linux machine, for example, to try and give this you know, give the clients the ability to generate considerably more load than they would with standard tuning uh, out of the box. So we're we're upping all of the memory, you know, allocations that it can use for talking over TCP. Uh, we're up, we're increasing the maximum number of connections that this uh, that they're allowed to maintain and communicate with each other. Uh, we're increasing our timeout. Um, so there's lots of tunes here. 
uh, to try and make sure this client is ready to generate seriously a lot of load. Then we want to check to make sure, and you have to do this on every client, you need to check and see is this client, when you've finished installing him, the chances are pretty good that he that the operating system install also installed a firewall. Well, if you have a firewall, then we need to get it turned off because these clients need to be able to talk to each other without any uh, firewalls blocking their communication. Uh, the Prime is going to be sending messages to the remote clients. He's going to be telling them start, stop, take your measurements, all kinds of little control messages, and it all communicates over, so over Berkeley sockets. And if you have a firewall running, it will pre prevent that communication. And when you start to try and run the benchmark, it will simply hang waiting for someone to unlock the door. So in this case, here's an example. On CentOS, you type this magic system CTL command, and it says, oh, look, I have a firewall, and it's enabled. So you then use the same command to disable that firewall service so that all of the machines can now talk to each other and not be blocked. Um, now, the next thing you need to consider is we don't really we haven't really tried generating any load yet, okay? But you can kind of do a back of the envelope calculation for load. You can go look at the definition of the workload in the SFS user's guide, and it'll tell you in the user's guide basically how many operations per second this thing is going to be doing for any given business metric. So the benchmark takes his input load values in his configuration file, he takes those in this thing called a business metric. And for each increment of business metric value, you can see in the definition for each of these workloads in the user's guide, how many operations per second is that an increment going to cause to happen upon storage. So as you increment your business metric, in the case of database, the You'll, you'll have a variable called load, L-O-A-D, and you'll increment it in what's called you know, the business metric, units monotomically increasing one through however big you think you, your box is capable of handling. But in addition to allocating, you know, saying I want a load of you know, 10 or 20 or whatever, um, and calculating how many ops per second that's going to generate on server, you know, can my server really handle this? So you're going to you know, back of the envelope say, well, I think it can handle this much load. When you figure out what that load is that you think it can handle, then you say, okay, in the business metric scale, you know, um, how many units is that? Because for each one of these different workloads, and there are four workloads, there's a different amount of memory that the client needs to have in order to run at that load level. So if you had a, a load level of one, then and you were running database then that client needs 55 megabytes of memory so he can run that without the client literally running out of memory and starting to page if he starts doing that you're no longer measuring the the product under test you're now bottlenecking on paging on the client so this is what this is trying to tell you is before you just crank it up and say let it go um, you need to figure out back of the envelope do i have enough memory for each of these different workload types. Then the next thing you need to do is check to make sure that your DNS system is actually working. So can I SSH from, every, from the prime, the first guy you installed and the one you're gonna be running the benchmark from, from him, can I log in and can, can I SSH to every other client node by its host name, not by its IP address, but by its host name, and will it let me in without challenging me for a password? Then the next thing you need to do is use the NS lookup utility, which is available under Unix as well as under Windows, on every client, and assure, ensure that if you, if you type in, you know, what is my host name, and you type NS lookup that host name, it will give you an IP address. If you then turn around and type in NSLOOKUP, that IP address, it should give you back the host name that you started with. Okay, if it doesn't give you back you know, the same name that you started with, 
then your DNS is improperly configured, and this benchmark will not run. It, it needs to have DNS properly configured, all right, or it literally will just hang because it needs to be able to communicate both directions from the prime to the remote clients and from the remote clients back. And it's going to be using, typically, it uses their host name to do this. Um, so this is just a sanity check to make sure everything is correctly configured. All right. <laughs> I'm going to go off and kind of show you temporarily here. I'm going to jump out to a live lab that I've got running. How am I going to do that? Um, I need to get out of that. Okay. And get over to a live lab and kind of show you what some of these things look like. So on this particular machine, this is a CentOS 7 box, I've got this software installed. And there's kind of his, yeah, let me clean that up. So that's under the spec SFS spec SFS 2014 underscore SP2 directory. Here's all of your software. Okay, and under the binaries directory, You'll see we support AIX, BSD, Linux, Mac OS, Solaris, and Windows. Under Windows, we have Win32 or Win64. And there's the executable for our 64-bit Windows. Under Linux, we have, again, I686 or 64. And there's your executable. So all of your pre-built binaries are there for all of these types of systems. And you can see that if I SSH, um, I should show you my client list. Um, So my clients are listed in this thing called the client mount point list. So the name of the machine that I'm currently on is CentOS 7 M1, and he appears in the list. So not only is this the prime client who's going to be communicating with the other clients, telling them to start and to stop and to take measurements and controlling the behavior of the remote clients, but he's also going to be able to generate load himself. Uh, this is true on Unix machines. You can generate load with the Prime. It is not true on Windows machines. On Windows machines, you must have a dedicated, you know, separate client node whose job it is is just to be the manager to run the other bench, you know, the other clients while they present load. It cannot present load in Windows. It has to do with um, Windows security policy that changed in Vista that prevents any application from logging into itself logging into the same node that is currently running on. It was a So then Don, these these are space limited. Right. Uh, a space limited list. thank you. Okay. Because right. the They're second okay. one starts out sent OS M seven M two. Got it. Right. Thank you. Okay. So we've got the client name is first and this is the NFS format. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll yep. show you both formats. Uh, yep. so this is the send you got your client host name that's going to be generating load colon and then where is the mount point where he's going to actually say that's the product under test that's his storage that he's providing to me okay so that's where i'm going to actually be generating files and presenting load is in slash mt slash free nash slash test mm -hmm. and that file system must already be mounted on this client before you ever start the test got it. the benchmark does not mount file systems it assumes you've already got them mounted and then the next load generator is CentOS 7 M2, and he's going out to test. And then M3 is going out to slash test, and then M4 is going out to test, and M5 is going out to test. And then he starts to list again with M1, only this time he's going out to slash MNT slash free nice slash test one. So this is how you can have a client who's going to have processes running on him that's generating load on more than one file system or in more than one directory of a file system. These could be separate mount points. Um, they can be whatever you want them to be. But that's how you get more than one uh, file system to be active from any given client is just list him 
list the client name again and a different path, and that he'll he'll, he'll use that. And that will round robin. And it will round robin. If the workload. Okay, got it. Okay. That's correct. So if I've got five clients. I've got them listed twice. There's ten there. So on the first load point of five, the first five clients in that list will get load. The other five in the list will not. At the next load point of incrementing by five, we're now running at ten. We will now have one process running on every one of those mount paths. So there'll got be two processes per client. One of those will be accessing test, the other one will be accessing test one. And if I were to go up to the next load point, he'll simply round robin and go back to the beginning of the list again. Great, so that's, thanks. That's what it looks like. And that's our list of clients here is we have CentOS 7 M1 through M5, okay? So that script that, that installed your SSH, okay, passwords, this his list of clients would be CentOS 7 M1, CentOS 7 M2, space delimited, okay? Now let me show you what that looks like on a Windows machine. So on a Windows machine, it looks like this. So I'm here I've got a different benchmark running called Software Build. I just started off with a load of one, probably should have started off with a load of two. Just for grins, let's change it to two. So his client mount points, the syntax is a little different. Here the syntax is the client's host name, colon, and then the UNC, okay, path, right, to the directory. So I have backslash, backslash, the name of the server, backslash, mount point, or directory, whatever, and then backslash, so in this case it would be a share. The share name was slash, it was smb underscore perf, and underneath smb underscore perf, the share, I have a subdirectory called test. And then the next one would be, I'm using the same client again, only this time he's going out full qualified UNC path out to test one. And the, the exec path, where is the benchmark installed? It follows the, the Windows naming convention of C colon backslash wherever you put this thing, okay? As we're on the Unix machine, the path was Unix format type name path. It's a full qualified path name to the actual executable itself. All right. So that's kind of giving you a live demo here. Uh, in both cases, I'm running as user caps, blah, 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 and literally warm up time, and you're pretty much out of variables because everything below this cut line, okay, eh, right here it says, do not edit below this line, <laughs> okay? So literally, there you're out of things to modify. You can modify these variables without getting an invalid run, and that's it. Uh, Warm-up time, you are allowed to change. You can change it from a minimum of 300 seconds to a maximum of one week <laughs> in seconds. So it's a very big number. If you want to warm up for a really long time, feel free. Okay. That's what it looks like on Unix and on Windows. And then... The next part is getting ready to set up the storage on your, your storage server so you can actually have him properly configured so he can run this benchmark. But I think we're three minutes from running out of time today, so I'm going to open it to Q, any questions, and I'll try and give you some answers. And at the end of that, we'll call it a wrap for today. So questions, please. <laughs> 